subscribe and click the notification bell and I'll make sure to be a part of the search and rescue team that goes to find you when you go missing, if you go missing. You may be wondering what Missing 411 means. Well, it's the title to a book series by former police detective David Paulitis that finally takes notice of the scarily large amount of unexplained disappearances in the national parks and forests of America. Because if you don't know, thousands of people have gone missing there in the most impossible, mysterious, and downright horrifying circumstances. Missing 411 is the reason why you should never be the last in line when traveling in a group in the woods. In this video, I'll be sharing 10 allegedly true accounts from people who believe they were almost taken in the forest and or people who have experienced bizarre and unexplainable phenomenon while hiking or camping. If you want your experience shared in an episode of Darkness Prevails, submit your story at darknessprevails.org and be sure to catch up on the show with my podcast at anchor.fm slash darknessprevails or with the iTunes link below. Something called my name from Evan. Location, Lawrence, Kansas. On my 18th birthday, I had decided it would be fun to gather all my closest friends and go on a camping trip. I had recently acquired my Eagle Scout badge, so I felt plenty prepared for what lay ahead of me. We packed up one Friday and headed to a lake near Lawrence, Kansas to enjoy the weekend at the campsite. It had been pretty enjoyable for the most part until Sunday afternoon before we were scheduled to leave. That night, people had gotten pretty out of hand and crazy. I had to rein everyone in and calm them down as the park ranger had told us to settle down or we would be ejected. Basically, I ended up having to be the babysitter at my own birthday party. Around 2 a.m., I finally got everybody to bed and was extremely stressed out, so I decided to take the small trail through the woods to a secretive beach we had discovered while exploring when we arrived there. I got to the beach and lay down on the sand to gaze at the stars and listen to the water lapping against the shore. It was very tranquil and was very soothing for me, until I heard someone calling my name from the woods. Actually, there were multiple voices calling my name from what I assumed was the trail. Evan. Evan. It sounded like my friend's voices, so I assumed they were out looking for me, as I had only told one person where I was going. I was about to get up and reply when something odd struck me. Some of the voices calling me were from people who did not go on this trip. Voices like my godfathers and my sisters, as well as a couple of others. After noticing this, I began to look around intensely, trying to keep all my sides covered, as I immediately got a very bad feeling. Then the voices seemed to shift from the forest to all around me, and then out to the lake. It was like the voices were being carried on the wind from the lake, calling my name over and over. Then they stopped out of nowhere, and I only heard one. It was a friend of mine who I had a crush on, and it was calling me, saying, Evan, join me in the lake. Immediately, red flags were set off as the same sentence kept getting repeated over and over but it kept getting more distorted with each telling. It was a small distortion, but I could definitely tell. It's hard to explain what it sounded like exactly, because I'd never heard anything like it before. Finally, I stood up and casually backed onto the trail. I kept my front facing the water. Then, when I was behind some trees, I turned and began to run back to camp. I made it back without incident, and I did not tell any of my friends about the experience until after we left the campsite. 
It has been six months since the incident, and now I haven't had much happen to me. Me and the girl I heard that night, we ended up dating, but every now and then, I get the feeling of a presence in my room that only seems to go away when my dog comes to sleep with me. Strange Experience on Studley Pike From Anonymous Location The border between Yorkshire and Lancashire, England High up on the moor, there sits an old building called the Studley Pike Monument. It's an imposing structure, which can be seen for miles. Essentially, it's a big stone cube topped with an obelisk. Inside the monument, there is a staircase which leads up to a viewing platform on the top of the cube section, which gives you maybe an extra 40 feet height to view the surrounding countryside. It's a place I've been to plenty of times, but recently, I ended up hiking around that area with a friend who hadn't seen it before. So we took a quick diversion to climb the pike and look at the monument at the top. At this point, we split off from each other to take some photos, adjust our backpacks, that sort of thing. When I headed to the spiral staircase to climb up to the balcony, I went alone. Now this staircase is made of the same dark stone as the rest of the monument. The curve on the spiral is very tight and claustrophobic, and it's pitch black. Already having been up it before, though, I knew this, so I had my phone torch already out and ready to go. As I was climbing, I could see a pair of walking boots in the dim light of my phone, just poking out from the curve of the staircase, climbing at the same speed as me. Assuming that this was my friend ahead of me, I made some offhand joke to her about hoping we didn't get attacked on the spooky steps. When I reached the balcony, however, she was nowhere to be seen. This balcony runs around the entire base of the obelisk, so it's impossible to have a view of the whole walkway at once. As I said, I've been up this thing a few times before now, so I didn't bother going around the whole thing. I just leaned by the doorway to take in the view while I waited for my friend, who I simply assumed had rushed off to do a lap of the balcony, maybe taking some pictures as she did so. After a minute, who should appear in the doorway, a little out of breath from climbing the stairs, but my friend. A bit confused, I quickly laughed it off. I thought you were already up here, I said. I was just talking to an absolute stranger thinking it was you. They must think I'm mad. A bit taken aback, she asked me if anyone else was up here. And after telling her about the stairs, she went off to soak in the views of the moor, expecting to bump into someone on the way around. I just carried on standing where I was, looking down onto the town of Todd Morden, trying to pick out any buildings I recognized, waiting for my friend to do her thing. A couple of minutes go by, and she comes back around the corner. Joking, I said. So, did they mention the random stranger chatting crap about being attacked? I was referring back to the joke I'd come out with on the staircase. Now it was my friend's turn to be confused. There's no one up here. Oh, I replied, processing that. That's weird. No one had walked past me, and I had been stood by the only door the whole time. I'd definitely seen and heard those feet coming up the stairs, but I hadn't really paid attention to who they were attached to, given that it was dark, and I was concentrating on my own feet to avoid tripping. Finally, I asked, Are you taking the piss out of me? No, she frowned. Are you? I shook my head, still a bit baffled and we both hurried back down to ground level, a bad feeling surrounding us. We continued our hike, and I tried to just sort of shrug the whole thing off. In hindsight, though, I'm still a bit confused and unsettled by the whole thing. Whose boots were those? I know someone was there with us. Where did they go? And what were they going to do? The Encounter 
from D-List 244. Location, Ohio. I was 11 years old and spending time with my mom at her place, along with her boyfriend and my brother. My parents had been divorced and I lived in Lincoln, but I finally got to see her and go to her house for a week. At one point during the week, we went to Raccoon Park. My family was there fishing when our dog, Rue, suddenly ran off. I immediately went off after him. It was then that I saw that they had paddle boats here. After getting Rue back under control, I told my family about it, and soon enough, my mom and I were the first onto one of the paddle boats. We began to paddle to the opposite bank, where the forest was thickest and beautiful and eerie at the same time. My mom wanted to see if the spot would be good for fishing, and I was just enjoying the scenery. That's when we began to hear rustling in the trees. We weren't scared at first, because we thought it may be a person, and if not that, probably just a raccoon, the namesake of the park. But something was odd about this. The rest of the campsites were empty when we pulled in, and the rustling was awfully heavy for something as small as a raccoon. Suddenly, a large tree branch above us snapped and fell right next to us in the water. I don't think we would have survived being hit by a tree branch that big. As we began to freak out and paddle away from that bank, a log the size of me at the time was chucked into the water, only barely missing the boat. My mother screams, and we're paddling for our lives. I looked back, and I swear to you, what I saw that day was a nine-foot-tall figure standing in the tree line, staring at us. It looked like a man, but he was far too tall and too built. I watched as it turned and disappeared into the trees behind it. All of my fear was confirmed when we got back to where the boats were kept, and the people who helped us out asked, so you saw it, didn't you? We left a couple of hours after that. We didn't feel safe out there. A couple of weeks later, when I was video chatting with my mother, what she told me was unbelievable to hear. She said that two other guys on a boat went by the same place that we did that day. They reported that all of a sudden something jumped from the bank and into the shallow water next to them and tried to pull one of the men into the forest. They made it out okay, managing to scare whoever or whatever it was away. But it makes me realize we came very close to danger that day. That man would have never been seen again if whoever or whatever that thing was had its way with him. The Screamer From Anonymous Location, Serbia They call my home country Small Russia, and for some people, the only difference they find is the language. But there's something different about my village in particular, because the folks in my village believe they're being attacked by something called the Drekovic, or the Screamer. They say it's in the woods around here, and according to legend, it's a demonic creature about the size of a child that can possess the souls of children if the child was not buried properly, or if the child's grave is too close to the edge of the cemetery. It can often appear in the form of a child, and if not, it will appear as something much more terrifying. They say it leads people on the wrong paths through the forest, causing people to become lost and to never be found. According to the legend, it usually appears from midnight until the first rooster crows in the morning. To be frank with you, we have in fact had some local disappearances in the forest, and though I think this legend is a bit sketchy, I feel that someone or something may be taking people. Anyway, here is the story. Two people in my village claim to have seen the Drekovec and to nearly become a victim to it. One man said he heard a scream in the middle of the night at around one in the morning. Because it sounded like a child in distress, 
he quickly grabbed a flashlight and ran outside his house to investigate. He called out to see if anyone needed help, but he didn't hear anything. After waiting a while and looking around, he finally decided to turn to go back inside, but there he saw it. A child sitting on his roof, smiling mischievously before jumping off of the house without any problem and running straight into the woods. The man, thinking it was one of the missing kids we have, ran after them into the forest, but as he broke the tree line, he heard voices coming from all around him, asking him to go every which way. He said he nearly got lost, but luckily, he ran in a random direction, which happened to be the right way. He then locked himself inside the house until sunrise. On another occasion, a local woman was driving next to the forest. When she saw a strange furry creature, she said it looked like the decaying form of a little girl, twisting and contorting its body in the most disturbing ways. Even though she was inside her car as she passed it, she could hear it audibly laughing at her. Thanks to these now common and terrifying experiences in my village, whenever I even have to get close to the forest, I keep my distance, and I make sure to keep a fast pace. The last thing I want is to hear the laughing or its scream. Strange Occurrences at the Ranch From Some Drummer Boy Location, Uvalde, Texas This is another story from my uncle's ranch in Texas. It was around 9 or 10 in the morning, and I had awoken to everyone getting up from the campsite and getting ready for breakfast. But there was a problem. No one had decided to bring any food for the morning after we arrived. Out of about 17 people, 11 including the adults, went into town to get things for breakfast and dinner, leaving the rest of us at the campsite. The eldest of us was a friend we called Sasquatch. He was left in charge until our advisor returned, but he decided to go back to sleep. The reason I mention him will come into effect later. Once I was fully awake, I didn't want to waste time just waiting for everyone to come back. I decided to go for a walk, alone, because the sun was out and everything would be illuminated and easy to see. Or so I thought. I don't remember telling anyone I was going for a walk. Anyway, just a short distance from camp, there was a thick section of wooded area. According to our advisor, the branches are so intertwined there that sunlight can hardly penetrate through to the ground. The night before, we had gone on a small tour of the ranch, passing through this area, which gave off a very eerie vibe, because they didn't look like trees but rather bony limbs. That was at night, though. During the day, I was standing right at the entrance, and sure enough, no sunlight was touching the ground in the area. At this time in my life, I was cautious about doing things that may have bad outcomes, but curiously, I decided to press on with my walk. I was following a makeshift trail, meandering through for a few meters, when the first red flag revealed itself to me. As I walked... I felt like I was being watched. I turned around to see something interesting. A relatively large coyote, but it looked rather sick or deformed. I stared with more curiosity than fear. The animal looked back at me from the other side of a fence, as if it was sizing me up. Personally, I thought it was cool to see an animal in real life instead of on TV, being from the city, of course. Soon the animal appeared to lose interest in me and ran off deeper into the forest. After the encounter, I resumed my walk, but when I was about halfway through the woods, I heard a really loud crunching sound coming several meters to my right. I snapped my head to that direction to see nothing but trees and hear nothing but silence. I felt a small breeze come through the trees and I start hearing light crunching sounds coming from my right, then my left, then behind me. Then suddenly something small falls quickly in front of me, 
a large dry leaf. I looked up to see that the breeze had knocked down the heavy dry leaves, which made a light crunch on impact. After rationalizing the creepy noises, I sighed and resumed to walk through the woods. But by this point, I was admittedly getting uncomfortable. I sped walked through, but the heavy crunching sounds returned, so I decided to get the pocket knife in my pocket out in case things got heated. I soon saw the exit and darted towards it, back into sunlight. The relief of being safe was short-lived, because I remembered the trail was a lot longer than I anticipated. I was contemplating sprinting back through the way I came, cutting through the trail to minimize time and distance. My back was still toward the woods while I was thinking about what to do next, but I was interrupted by a loud groaning sound coming from behind me. I basically dove in front of myself, prepared my pocket knife, and spun around to face whatever the heck was making that noise. To my relief, it was just a herd of longhorns that were just passing through, and they were the ones making the loud crunching sounds as well. But now I couldn't go back, because they were blocking the path, so I continued along the perimeter of the ranch. After about 100 feet, I saw something breathtaking. Hundreds or thousands of flowers of different colors as far as the eye could see. A truly beautiful sight. Well, I continue forwards to the final bend of the path, and the second red flag comes up. As I was coming toward the final bend, I came to another closed gate that leads to a dried creek bed. I turned toward the direction of the camp when I stopped to observe a herd of deer crossing over from the woods to behind the campsite. Once they crossed, I continued on, but was immediately startled by the sound of deep, guttural laughter coming from the bottom of the hill, where the closed gate was. It sounded like Sasquatch back at camp, the guy I told you about before. But it was distorted. It sounded like it was supposed to be a laugh, but ended up being more similar to a freaking predator from the movie. My heart was racing, because Sasquatch was prone to pranking people, but this wasn't really his brand of prank. I began to hurry back to camp to see if he was still there. Upon returning back, I saw that he was still fast asleep, and I didn't say anything to anyone, because I passed it off as a figment of my imagination. As I look back on that day, I feel like something was following me. Nothing else major happened that day, but I do feel that I was nearly taken. A Call from the Forest From Yellow Bellow 1 Location Unknown I was around 8 or 9 years old when this quick experience happened. At the time, the word paranormal was just a pretty big word to me. I was playing on the edge of the forest one day with a few of my friends, when, out of nowhere, a voice came from the woods directly next to us and it sounded exactly like my mother. The voice only repeated itself once more, and I can assure you, I remained at the edge. I walked the area around to see if I could see my mom in there, but there was no one in sight. I walked up into the breezeway where I yelled up to my mother shortly afterwards and asked what she had wanted. The answer she gave me made me want to run up the steps, because she said she hadn't called for me at all. Years later, when I heard a few similar experiences, I now know the wisest decision was not entering those woods. That wasn't my brother's voice. From Lacrimosa. Location. Unknown. This occurred when I was 15 and camping with my brother and his oldest son. My brother has always been drawn to nature and prefers to be out in it as often as he can. My nephew, on the other hand, not so much. I love nature and also feel a close connection with it. This story starts with me and my nephew out gathering some good firewood and kindling. It was nearing dusk, so the light was fading 
and the forest was slowly cloaked in shadows. The sounds of the forest were nearly deafening. The cries of the cicadas, the chirping of crickets, the loud hoots of a great horned owl. My nephew and I heard my brother calling us back to camp. So, as we had gathered quite a bit of stuff, we began to head back in the direction of his voice. As we got closer, I noticed that the voice sounded off. Like it was him, but at the same time, it wasn't. In addition, I noticed that our surroundings were now unfamiliar. Something wasn't right, and my gut told us we needed to get out of that area now. I dropped my firewood and placed my hand on my nephew's shoulder, who was still going forward. The following conversation is paraphrased, as I cannot remember it exactly word for word, but it was something like this. We need to get back to camp now. My nephew replied, oh, Come on, don't tell me you're scared of the dark. I'm not scared of the dark, I'm scared of the things in it. The camp's right up ahead, though. No, it's not. Does anything around us look familiar to you? My nephew looked around and his face drained of color. His panic and fear set in. I was scared out of my mind too, but I was doing my best to keep it together, mostly for my nephew's sake. Where are we? He asked. We went way deeper than we were supposed to. We need to head the opposite direction of that voice. But why would my dad call us out there? Is he trying to get us lost? No, he wouldn't do that. Not at night, or not close to nightfall anyway. We both went quiet for a second and looked at each other with terror. The forest, which had minutes ago been a cacophony of sound, was now completely silent. Not even the wind moving through the trees made a sound, even though we were watching the wind blow through leaves. Then the voice came again, sounding closer than before telling my nephew to come here now. The two of us dropped all the firewood and kindling we had and booked it back to the campsite as fast as possible. We ran back the way we came, but we heard the crunching of underbrush, dry twigs and pine needles following us, keeping speed with us. My nephew tripped over a tree that had fallen in a recent windstorm and thus blocked the trail. I recalled having to step over it when we gathered firewood earlier. Despite how much I disliked my nephew, I knew I couldn't just leave him there for whatever was coming towards us. The forest was still silent, and the sounds of footsteps were quickly approaching. I don't know why I said what I did as the thing got closer to us. Maybe it was the adrenaline, but I remember yelling something along the lines of, you're not my brother and leave us alone. After a few seconds and not hearing anything more but the sounds of forest, I helped my nephew up, and we walked the quarter of a mile back to camp. My brother had been worried sick about us, and had even contacted park officials due to us being missing for so long. So when we showed up back at camp, he was equally furious and thankful that we were okay. Though he did ask what had happened, and why we had been gone so long. Turns out we were gone for more than three hours, though I swear we'd only been collecting firewood and kindling for not more than 45 minutes. When this happened, I honestly thought we were goners. I told him our story in my brother's sight heavily, telling us that we were both very lucky to get away with our lives. He didn't elaborate as to why he said that, until many years later when I had turned 18. He told me in private that what I and my nephew had encountered that night may have been a skinwalker. Up to that point, my brother was skeptical of their existence, aside from the tales of a few of his hiking buddies and park rangers he knew quite well. Needless to say, I don't go into any sort of wooded area at night if I can avoid it. Strange Encounter in the Forest From Miho Location Unknown This happened in January of 2018. We went to this New Year's thing at my grandparents' house to see some relatives and to visit them because we barely ever get to. 
They live in a small village with around 300 other people. Most of them are my grandparents' age. Besides a very old playground, there is a small shrine circa one kilometer away from the village. To reach it, we always have to walk through a forest. I know it sounds kind of cliche, but it's quite dark in there, even when it's still daytime. We arrived around 4 p.m., so it was already quite late, and we still had to wait for most of our relatives to arrive. My brother, let's call him Ryun for now, suggested that we should visit the shrine with the children that are already there, so that they don't get too bored. Because, honestly, there wasn't much to do at my grandparents' place. We asked around if anyone wanted to come with us, and in the end we had about six people in total. Ryun, my girlfriend, and I were the oldest, so we kept an eye on the children who were walking with us. Ryun walked a bit behind the group, and my girlfriend and I were walking ahead. The reason Ryun walked behind us was that in this area, there are a lot of stray dogs. I wanted to make sure the children were safe. When we arrived at the shrine, we prayed and then sat down on a few stones near the shrine, talking to each other while the kids played a few rounds of tag. Around the shrine area was a high wire fence so the visitors weren't bothered by animals or the earlier mentioned stray dogs. The only way to enter this area were the steps, so we didn't worry too much. We probably spent nearly an hour there before we decided to return home because it was already quite dark and we didn't want to wander in the forest at night. When we called the children back to us, one of our cousins asked if they could take Bada with them. We were confused until Ryun said that she probably meant an imaginary friend or something. Honestly, it was a bit creepy, but my girlfriend quickly said that we could visit Bada tomorrow again, and we really needed to leave now because it was getting late. They were okay with this, and so we left. This time, I was the one walking behind the group. After we walked for a while, the cousin from earlier pointed into the woods and said, There's Bada. We turned our heads in the direction, but didn't see anything. Ryun told us to stop walking and to be quiet for a moment. Later, he told us that he wanted to hear if there was any kind of growling. Of course, we didn't hear anything. My girlfriend used her cell phone to light up the area a bit. She didn't have a flashlight in her phone, so she just turned the brightness all the way up on the display. And honestly, later, I was kind of glad that her phone didn't have a flashlight. After a few moments, we decided to continue walking, but my girlfriend still used her cell phone to light up the area. Suddenly, she jumped a bit, even though it looked more like she was pulling her shoulders back. We asked her if something was wrong, and she whispered, left side. We didn't know what she meant until we froze and saw the two glowing points in the distance. We first thought that this might be some metal reflecting the light, but then the points partly disappeared and reappeared, so it had to be something that was moving. I felt the urge to cry and scream then. Normally, I'm not easily creeped out, but this was even too much for my brother who had been in the military. It was definitely too large to be a dog or raccoon. When we heard that leaves were rustling like someone was walking through the bushes in our direction, all of us agreed that we should pick up the kids and get the heck out of there. We were running while my brother and I were carrying our cousins. When we made it back to our grandparents' house, which was directly beside the forest, my sister and our male cousin were crying. Of course, the adults asked what happened. We told them what happened and they kind of believed us and told us we should not go back there tomorrow. And to ease our worries, my grandmother put a bit of salt lines in front of the windows and doors. It might sound silly to you, but it made us feel better. But the worst part was not over yet. Ryun, my girlfriend, and I shared a room, but we couldn't sleep at all that night. So we stayed up talking for a bit about what had happened earlier. After a while, we did get tired and tried to sleep, but soon the peaceful silence would be interrupted by something that sounded like claws walking on wood. You know, the click-clack when your dog walks on a wooden floor. But this was slower and heavier, like one claw at a time. At this point, none of us were moving, 
and we hoped that it really was just a dog or a fox. When it became silent again, we waited a few more minutes, and then we moved as far away from the window as possible, sleeping on the ground. It took us a while, but we finally were falling asleep at some point. In the morning, my father woke us up, saying that we shouldn't have gotten so wild. At first, we didn't know what he meant, until we realized that we were sleeping cuddling together covered with several blankets. After this, the next two nights, nothing happened, but we didn't visit the shrine while we were there the rest of the time. When we drove home, we asked our father if he believed us, that there was something out there, and he said that he did. But our mother, who claims to be more rational, told him to be quiet because he could startle my sister. I still believe that whatever was there didn't have friendly intentions for us, and I still hope that we never see Bada again. Lost in the Forest from Dalaplore V Location Unknown When I was about 16 years old, I used to live near an old thick forested area. Forever, I simply thought it was an overgrown place. I never imagined that something might be living there. One night while I was alone at my house with my girlfriend, Lisa, I got a sickening feeling that something was off and that someone was watching us. I asked Lisa if she felt it too. She replied with a quick no, and with that, I tried to think nothing more of it. I assumed I was just nervous, since that was the first time that we spent this much time together all at once. About ten more minutes pass, and out of nowhere I hear a strange boom sound. It sounded like it was coming from behind the house. I then decided that this was my chance to show Lisa that I was a dude that could protect her so I proceeded to go out the front door with my phone flashlight on. As I got toward the back of the house, I saw that our soft sheet metal shed had a large dent in the side of it. It was around the size of a soccer ball, almost like a kid had kicked a ball at it as hard as they could. I didn't really know what could have caused it, as it was nearly midnight. There was no one around, and my nearest neighbor was about six blocks away. I then decided to just leave it as is and go back inside. When I came back in, Lisa had a look on her face like no other. Her face was pale and had a look of pure fear on it. I asked what was wrong, and she said that when I went to the back of the shed to investigate, she looked through the window and saw what she described as a figure that was very tall and slim and appeared to be wearing a cloak. She said it was standing almost directly behind me, and that every time I turned around, it would move with my body, and it was out of my view. She said it appeared to glide. This really freaked me out, as from what she described would have been at the very edge of the thick wooded area. I didn't know what to think. Lisa decided to head home as it was very late, and her parents would be mad at her for being out so late. After she was gone, I was alone, I turned off everything in my house. That way I could hear everything going on outside. After almost four hours of sitting in the dark in my living room, I could finally see the sun coming up. And with that, I heard a muffled voice coming from outside, saying, You're lucky you didn't come back out. My Encounter From Ben Insanity Location, unknown. This was God knows how many years ago. All I know is that I was very young. I can't remember much of it, but I do remember it. My friends and I were playing a game in the middle of the woods called Camouflage. It's sort of like hide and seek. Basically, the person who's it stands in one place the hiders then hide all around that person, but you have to be able to see the seeker. You then have to try and sneak undetected to a designated safe zone. The game is over when either everyone has been caught or makes it to the safe zone. My strategy for this game is mostly hiding rather than sneaking. I would usually hide a ways away, but to the point that I could still see the seeker. 
I was a little far this time, which in turn made the game harder for me to survive, but I didn't mind it. I always liked being alone, but the woods can always be a little nerve-wracking. You never really know what could reside there. It can really make the imagination run wild. Plus, you kind of always feel like something is watching you. It was about two o'clock, and it was really nice out that day. The forest trees hid some of the sunshine, but only a bit. There was still sunlight finding its way through the trees, and it made the area we were at look really scenic and beautiful. My friend Henry was the seeker. He counted to 60, and we all went to hide. I was about 200 feet away behind a big redwood tree. It was on a hill, and I could clearly see everything from where I was. I could see all of my friends sneaking around, and Henry searching for them. I wasn't moving, just more of observing from a distance. I was there for about seven minutes, when I started to feel strange. I got the tingling sensation where you know you're not alone. I didn't want to turn around for fear of what I might see, but I knew that I had to. I knew that something was there. As I turned, all I could see was just a big hairy figure. As I looked and observed the creature in front of me, I could see it much more clearly. The creature was about 15 feet away from me, and it stood at about 8 feet tall, covered in reddish brown fur. It had huge arms and a big puffed out chest, its face similar to a gorilla, but a bit more human than that. I was absolutely speechless. I tried to speak or make some kind of noise, but I couldn't. I didn't feel in danger, though, oddly enough. The creature seemed more curious toward me than malicious. It tilted its head, then scratched it, as if it was thinking, and it just kept watching. We stared at each other for maybe 30 seconds. I looked into its eyes, and they seemed peaceful. He seemed to be just checking out the situation, wondering why I was in the woods this far. After he was satisfied with what he had found, he trotted off into the woods, and despite being so big, he didn't make a single sound. Well, I thought, that's why I didn't hear him coming. I went back to my friends in the middle, and they were all waiting for me. Dude, where were you? Henry asked. We were looking everywhere for you. I guessed I'd been gone longer than I thought. I was up there by the big redwood, I said. Okay, well, I think we're going to call it a day, he said. We were hearing some weird things coming from where you were, so I think we're just going to split. Perfect. Even though the creature didn't hurt me, I still just didn't want to be out there. We departed for the day and went to a friend's house to play some video games. I personally tried to forget about it all but my mind was still wondering about it. The next time you're in the woods or plan on taking a trip out in them, make sure you bring a GPS of some kind and always tell a loved one where you're going because the last thing you want is to get lost in the woods or taken and no one has any clue where to start looking. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this episode. And don't forget, you can send me your stories at darknessprevails.org. If you want to support the show, donate any amount at patreon.com slash darknessprevails. Patrons unlock ad-free mp3 access to our episodes, and they get their names in the credits at the end of these videos. Or you can click the shop button below if you're on YouTube, or just go to teespring.com slash stores slash darkness prevails to shop our Darkness Prevails merchandise. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video. About 10 horrifying emergency calls. Parvis Gaming says, what's your favorite sandwich? My answer is straight up. I just like plain turkey sandwiches with nothing on it but the turkey. I don't know why. I just don't like much else. It's boring, I know. Jesse Hardy says, Early for once. Me and my hubby love cuddling in bed and listening to these. Love you, darkness. Thanks for the love and support. I'm glad you guys can enjoy these episodes. I love that Darkness Prevails can be a household family name. We can all be scared together, I guess. 
Sock person says, yes, got the notification. Now I'm going to scare the crap out of my friends. You sound like a keeper, sock person. The kind of friend I'd be friends with. Ruby Trujillo says, I love these stories. They really add to my paranoia. Ugh, I know, right? As if I need more of that. Joe Garcia says, Boy, what does it take to be first? You probably gotta work at YouTube. And even then, they don't give anybody notifications anymore. So good luck with that. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. But don't you worry, because more scary stories are always coming soon. So stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.